and welcome everyone to today's Synergist webinar, Engineered Noise Control Solutions. I'm Kay Bechtold, Managing Editor of the Synergist, the magazine of AIHA. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and especially Kinetics Noise Control for sponsoring this webinar. Today's speaker is John Sofra, who is Director of Sales for Kinetics Noise Control. John is responsible for the North American territory for the airflow attenuation, industrial, and environmental markets. He has been with Kinetics Noise Control for 20 years. Previously, John spent 15 years holding various positions, including acoustics division manager for a national sheet metal duct and fitting manufacturer located in Columbus, Ohio. John's current team is made up of many sales and engineering professionals focused on airflow and acoustics. He has been involved in ASHRAE, ASTM, and AMCA during his many years in industry. And now I'll turn the presentation over to John. Thank you, Kay. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. I think the sound test worked out well. And uh, the title of the presentation today is called Engineer Noise Control Solutions. I'm happy to be able to discuss this important topic uh, on controlling noise in your manufacturing facilities and surrounding areas. Get the right button here. There we go, I do have control. Um, we start out with, I think a presentation always starting out with is, you know, the purpose of the presentation is why choose an engineer con noise control solution? And uh, what other options are there? And, and why is this topic so different or particular or special? So if we look at different types of noise controls, uh, the one we're talking about here is an engineered noise control, and you want to basically eliminate or control the noise at its source or engineer out the noise, some people say, and you can use a noise control product to do that, or sometimes you can actually look at replacing loud older equipment with newer equipment, because newer equipment tends to often be quieter. The process has been studied, and it's quieter equipment. So uh, those that's an engineered solution. Take uh, Control the noise at the source. Another uh, type of control for noise is an administrative control. Uh, you can incorporate changes in the work procedures, such as reducing the duration somebody might be in an area. Maybe you're running at very loud noise levels in an area, but the employee uh, only has to work in that area for maybe an hour a day or 15 minutes a day or, or, or things like that. So we can look at that and control their exposure to these high noise levels by making sure they're not in the area when they don't need to be. And then there's the old tried and true personal protective equipment. Uh, earplugs, muffs, uh, the solution many people go to first. Uh, they, they think it's easy, you know, a lot of times though with uh, earplugs, uh, people, although they're supposed to get new earplugs all the time, a lot of times they use earplugs over and over throughout the day. Uh, so there's some health issues there, some dirt and some problems with your ears there and then fit up. And then also if you're walking around with muffs and earplugs, uh, often it's hard to have the sensory perception around you if there's an emergency or things like that or hear somebody coming up on you. So those are just some of the things. Uh, why would we want to control the noise at the source? Because the goal here is to really get you out of the PPE when at all possible, control the noise at the source one time it's finished. When is noise control even required? So a lot, many of us, I'm sure all of us on the call here are familiar with OSHA. Uh, they have a standard and they have a, that an employer has to have a hearing conservation program in place if workers are exposed to a time weighted average TWA noise level of 85 dBA or higher over an eight hour work shift. Now that doesn't mean that you can't have periods of louder noise levels, but when you take a time weighted average over a period of eight hours, uh, it has to be, uh, uh, should be less than 85 dBA, or we have to incorporate a hearing conservation program. Let's put this all in perspective though. So we talk about an 85 dBA level uh, 65 dBA is normal speech. Maybe uh, there's a, there's two of us in the hallway. We're talking to each other about three feet apart, and uh, it's a normal building hallway, uh, solid floor, you drop ceiling, things like that, and hard surface walls. We're going to be talking at about 65 dBA. We start to run into issues when we run into anything greater than 85 or 90 to 95 over a sustained exposure. Then it starts to get louder. 
and we start to uh, uh, sustain some hearing loss over time. And just to really stretch the limits, uh, if you're at 125 dBA and you happen to be experience your ears exposed to that unprotected, you're going to actually feel pain. And then at 140, maybe a jet engine test cell or something at 140 dBA, you can have irreversible hearing damage. Uh, so those are just some things kind of give you perspective of where did 85 fit in there? And it fits in pretty much between your, you know, it's, it's above your normal speech and uh, just below where you run into hearing loss over time. So we look at a hearing conservation program. OSHA now says, uh, okay, we're 85 dBA or above. We need to have a hearing conservation program in place. And so there has been a lot of studies done. Uh, this may not be true for everybody, but over an average group of studies, uh, OSHA says, hey, you should figure as an employer a cost of $350 per worker per year. Uh, what does that cost entail? Well, that would that would be including your audiometric testing for a hearing conservation program, testing equipment associated with that same program, workers' compensation, hearing protective devices such as the muffs and the earplugs, training on how to use everything properly, how to stay in certain areas less time, more time, things like that, hearing loss investigations when somebody files a claim, and then also workers' time. So that goes all into that $350 estimated cost, actual cost to the bottom line per year. So if we look at this, we say I had $350. Well, if it's a group of 10 employees, uh, you're looking at $3,500 a year. If it's a group of 30 employees, you're looking at 10,500, all the way up to if you have 100 employees, it's a $35,000 a year. Um, the key thing here is to look at this. People say cost, well, it doesn't seem that high. All I know is many people are always trying to reduce costs and all of us in, in manufacturing are aware of that. The key with this, you have a hearing conservation and program in place. Uh, you have to wear earmuffs, you have to wear earplugs. This is a cost that keeps on costing, or you know, you always say keeps on giving. This keeps costing year over year. And then of course it can go up due to inflation and things like that. So those are one of the things, how can I get rid of that, that uh, continuous cost year over year? So we look at methods of noise control. So when we get back to that engineered noise control solution, we want to engineer out the noise. We want to control the noise at its source. We investigated trying to come up with uh, maybe new equipment, uh, balancing the cost of new equipment to are they really more efficient or, or, or are they quieter? So after looking at all that, uh, we look at the best option is how can we look at the process flow, the equipment, the operation of the equipment, and come up with noise control at the source to get everyone out of hearing protection and get the noise levels below 85 dBA. One method is that we'll cover is sound absorbers, uh, sound barriers, composites, which is a combination absorber and barrier, kind of the best of both worlds, and then ventilation silencing, because we're going to have a lot of fans, a lot of cooling systems that have air flowing by that we want to control that noise as well. When we start with sound absorption, you know, why is sound absorption important? Well, absorption will lessen this echo in a space. So let's say you have a bunch of equipment in an area of a factory that we show here. And the factory floor is concrete, the factory walls are cinder block, uh, and the ceiling under roof might be a corrugated roof system. So there's a lot of reflective surfaces. It's going to echo a lot. It's going to reverberate. And actually, if you had only one piece of equipment operating, it would be, let's say, a certain noise level. Let's pick an example of 100 dBA. But then when you start adding a second noise level, that 100 dBA goes up to 103 dBA. If you start adding more and more, they start working together and creating more noise. Now the reflective surfaces also compound that energy and just allow that energy to continually uh, bounce off the walls combined and, and actually get quite loud. So what we would want to do in an area like this is how do we soften those walls? That softening we're talking about is called sound absorption. And that's, that's basically what we're going to talk about next. So if you look at this, basically sound is energy. 
In this picture here, we have a receiver. We have a blue, purple, however you see it on your screen, a solid reflective wall. Maybe that's the cinder block wall of the factory. We have a noise source, which could be the process or equipment noise. And then all that noise comes through, bounces off that wall, but let's put an absorbent material here. And so that sound energy has to propagate through that absorbent material. Some of that energy is dissipated as heat. Some of it gets broken up. Some of it's actually going to bounce back off that wall once it goes through the absorber and have to go through the absorber again. So now you're getting this absorption, this softening, this reduction of, of reverberations and reflections within the space. If you're looking at different absorptive products, you always want to look at a way, you know, there, there actually is a way called noise reduction coefficient on how to quickly uh, rate the merit of each product, which product is better than the other. So per the ASTM standard uh, for sound absorption and testing, uh, what they do is they take an arithmetic average of sound absorption at the 250 hertz, 500 hertz, 1000 and 2000 hertz octave band center frequencies, and they yield a single value number. And that's a noise reduction coefficient, NRC. Now, an NRC of zero means it's perfectly reflective. There's no absorbency there. There's no absorption. That's what we're trying to improve upon or reduce. We're trying to reduce those reflective surfaces. An NRC of one is what they would call a perfect absorber. And so you will at times see something with an NRC of greater than one. Now that's just an arithmetic calculation on how things go through this NRC process when you take the actual test data from the lab for sound absorption and, and you come into this uh, routine of NRC. Anything greater than one, it's still really one. One is the perfect absorber. However, um, just due to the arithmetics, you see some values greater than one. So basically if something had an NRC of a point eight, it would absorb less than a one or a 0.5 and so on. Sound absorption is great in spaces like that picture we just showed you on a few slides ago, where there are multiple pieces of equipment, probably a lot of congestion, a lot of flow, process flow that you can't interrupt. So when that happens, we would nice, it'd be nice to look at, let's put absorption, things that we can put on the walls or the ceiling to stay out of the normal path of production. That's okay as long as you're looking at noise reduction targets of 10 to 12 dBA or less. So if you need 25 dBA reduction, it's not going to be feasible to put absorption solely in the space. Um, we'll talk about that as we move through. So if you need, you know, 6 dBA reduction, 8 dBA, all the way up to 12 dBA, it can be cost effective and, and efficient to use sound absorption. Now, some people look at 10 dBA noise reduction. That doesn't sound like a lot. Let's say you, you were at 100 dBA and you reduce it to 90. Boy, that doesn't seem like a lot. But because acoustics, decibels, and whatnot are logarithmic based, a 10 dBA sound reduction is actually gonna be perceived by you and I the, as sounding half as loud as it did before. So if you took something from 100 dBA to 90 dBA, you would actually say, wow, that sounds half as loud as it did before. And it was only a 10 dBA drop. Now, 100 dBA to 90 dBA, was that quiet enough? No, we really want to get down to the OSHA standard 85 or below. In fact, we'd like to get less than 85. So maybe we needed to add more absorption and we'd have to look at that. But once again, we're looking at the walls, the ceiling of the space. That becomes the focus. Where can we put absorptive materials? But before we want to look at absorptive materials, we have to know what our hang, we call it hang time, or what the decay rate of noise is. You know, you go into a gymnasium somewhere and you pop a balloon. What's the hang time? How long does it take for that noise to dissipate with the hard surfaces in place? 
And then we start adding absorptive materials and we look at the square footages of absorptive materials versus the overall makeup of the room. And then we start to run with a decay rate to come up with your noise reduction. So there's a, there's a lot, there's a nice reverberation analysis that's done. Uh, it isn't just a matter of, of rule of thumb, hmm, cover 50%, I think it'll work. It's not like that. But we want to look at the construction of the walls and the ceiling. We want to look at the dimensions of the space, the room. And then we want to look at lighting and sprinklers and things like that. Overhead cranes, we don't want to interfere with those if we're going to put anything on the ceiling. Sometimes you only need to put things on the wall, but if you put it on the ceiling, we had to be uh, considerate of that. One product you may have seen before is a quilted absorber. It's a quilted fiberglass. Uh, it has an aluminized vinyl faced impregnated face cloth around it and it's stitched. You can hang it with grommets. Uh, you can lag it into furring strips on walls. There's a lot of things you can do. It's NRC ranges from anywhere from 0.7 to 1.1. Remember what I mentioned about the 1.1 being greater than one? It's basically a perfect absorber. Of course, a function of how much you actually put in the room. Uh, and you can look at automotive garages, environmental control booths. You can look at me mechanical equipment spaces or congested equipment spaces. It comes in various nominal thicknesses. That is nominal before it's stitched. So the nominal thicknesses are one inch thick, two inch thick, and four inch thick. Of course, the thicker the material, the more sound absorption or sound energy you can absorb for a given square footage of that material. This is a great example here of an area similar to the picture I showed you before, which was a, just a simple uh, diagram, is you have a lot of congestive space here in the lower right of the lower uh, in the lower right of the of the right picture. A lot of congestion in here. There was no way to physically enclose any piece of equipment or process. So the area, uh, the acoustical consultant would go through, they'd look at the uh, reflectivity, you got cinder block walls, you got concrete floor, you have the underside of the corrugated steel uh, roof sheeting. So they look at that and they, they take sound level measurements of what it is without any absorption in here. Then they do a reverberation analysis to determine how much of this quilt you need. The nice thing with quilt is it's pretty light, that is light in weight. Uh, this happens to be light too because it's light in color, but you can have it in a various uh, large group of colors. So if you wanted to alternate these maybe with your with your um, uh, logo or your colors, that can be done. But a lot of times in factories, they like the lighter the better of the color, uh, reflects light well, keeps things bright. These are all hung. They're four foot tall and they're 20 foot horizontal sections and they have grommets on either end. So what they did was they hung them at the top and then each time a grommet comes together of each what we call four tiers here, uh, we would go ahead and use nylon zip ties or wire ties to connect those together. And we're just adding material to the space and then looking at what our reverberation analysis come, comes back to us. This comes in various materials too. It, it, it can be just standard areas like this, but maybe you're in a wastewater treatment plant. Maybe you're in some place where there's some chemicals and erosion, you know, some materials. There is a silicone face version of this, which can help you as well uh, to withstand some of the elements and the chemicals and the exposure that it can be. So there, it comes in a lot of different facings. Another one is a hanging baffle. Let's say we don't want anything on the walls or, hey, we put stuff on the walls, but we ran out of wall space and we're not quiet enough. Uh, so now we have to use some hanging baffles. The hanging baffles are really neat. Uh, they come in various facings. Once again, different colors. You can make them out of a sailcloth material, which comes in a variety of colors. You can also here is shown a poly with a heat sealed bag. Uh, often they, they come in different sizes. Standard is like a two foot tall, four foot long, and you put a grid of these hanging, or you can make them four foot tall, eight foot long, all kinds of things, but they can also meet FDA applications, FDA approved applications, where you can use a Tyvek. Uh, and when you can do this, um, whether you use different facings, we try to stick within the same facing so you get the same acoustic transparency and the same sound absorption. Uh, but if you were to make this with a different facing, you would analyze it appropriately for any reduced 
uh, sound absorption. Here's an exa example of an excellent um, application. You know, it, it always amazed me. I think of the automotive industry and I think of all the subs that the automotive industry has, people making this, people making this for the, and then supplying it to the main factory. This is actually a sub for a company that's making candy for one of the major candy uh, companies. And uh, what was interesting here was they were running about 90 dBA. Uh, they were wearing earplugs. Uh, of course, the earplugs had the lanyard. Uh, but they were also making candy that looked very similar to chiclets. I might be dating myself, but very similar. The candy looked like an earplug. And what they were always worried about was we have to reduce the noise. We can't enclose the process, but we have to reduce the noise and get people out of hearing protection because the worst thing that could ever have is get a, get a used uh, 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 earplug fall into the thing and somebody opens up their candy and there's a earplug in there. So what we used or what was used here was a four foot tall, eight foot long Tyvek covered uh, two inch thick uh, baffles. And these are the hanging baffles. And you can see they really work out well. This was a 20 foot tall base. So you really want to go with those four foot high kind of looking at the aspect ratio instead of putting a little, bunch of little uh, uh, two foot or two foot high baffles up there. It's easier on installation, fewer baffles. It's all about the total absorptive square footage. And you were, it, it didn't interrupt with the lighting and it didn't interrupt with the sprinkler system. So just some things to look at there. You can also look at uh, sound absorption with some different products. One is, this is a fiberglass uh, interior core and then it's wrapped with a foil scrimmed face product. I must remind you too, all the products that we are going to show today or discuss, they're all class A fire rated. So that, that's very important. Some of them are even more stringent than class A. Uh, some of them are plenum rated like the silencers, but these are all class A fire rated every slide, even though this is one of the, I don't have it on every slide. Uh, it is all class A fire rated. So I think that's very important because that's one of the first things you're going to be asked was, hey, I can't just put this up on my walls. Uh, how does it uh, react to fire? So the NRC here is a 0.75 to 0.96. This product can be one or two or four inches thick. There's another product down here, which is actually um, PET, polyester uh, panels, which are also thick, durable, uh, and they're also... Uh, um, you know, some clothing's made of the same material, but also recycled bottles, like our bottles uh, that we use uh, to drink out of. Our water bottles are made of the same material. So that's another product that can be used. And this is just a smattering here, but I, I always like to show pictures of projects. Here's a hydroelectric plant, and it was making a lot of noise. And they were able, to, even though there were th items on the walls and switch gears and gauges and things, they were able to fit material on here uh, as much as possible. It doesn't really matter how it goes in place. The important thing is that the material is exposed, the, all the square footage, and that it's in the area and it's not interrupting with anything. And then down below here is a, a multi-generator uh, mechanical room. Um, I don't always pick the foil face. It kind of makes me a little freaky uh, to go in there, but uh, a lot of times I'll pick white, but the foil looks nice. A lot of people like it, and uh, that's just absorptive material as well. And then here you can see the, the material was actually uh, kind of snaked up and attached above the joists and, and within the rafters uh, in an area where there was a lot of um, uh, forklift traffic, and so they were able to reduce that. The other thing is, is we can look at another product, which is a rigid sound absorber. The other stuff we call soft goods, whereas this is a metal or aluminum perforated panel with a bagged fill inside. Here's one with a V-shaped uh, system, a V-group system, giving it a little more sound absorption. Mostly it looks nice, but giving it a little more surface area. Um, and it can be used indoors or outdoors. Maybe you have an equipment yard outside or a side of a building where you might have a corral of a dust collector or some process, but the reflectivity off the wall of the building is just overshooting that. These are products you can use. You can use them in wastewater treatment plants. And once again, this is sound absorption. 
you want 10 to 12 dBA noise reduction or less. And this just shows you different areas. Here's a dynamometer test cell where they use those metal perforated panels. Here's an outdoor equipment yard. They use the same panels. And here's an area too, which was actually an area they were making um, uh, catalytic converters actually. It's a very, very clean plant. And uh, they were making catalytic converters and we needed to quiet that down or they needed to. So that was sound absorption. Now I need a little more noise control. I, 10 to 12 isn't gonna do it for me. I may need 18 to 25 or more, 45 dBA reduction. And so you wanna start looking at sound blocking. And basically the energy, if you look at this blocking, sound blocking material, some of it's gonna be bounced back towards the process or the equipment that it might be blocking or enclosing. Some of it'll transmit through, some of the sound energy will, and that's where you get that noise reduction. It's all a function of the pound per square foot that your sound blocking mass or material is. So the higher the pound per square foot, the more noise control you'll get. And you can see that here, like the NRC, the noise reduction coefficient, we have the sound transmission coefficient or STC. Once again, it's to show the merit. It's to look at a grouping. Uh, this was actually a graphical. You have to determine this graphically. You measure per the ASTM standard E90 for transmission or sound blocking capabilities. And then you take that spectrum per octave band, 125 hertz up through 4,000 hertz, and you move that up and down till you get these differences on this given uh, fixed curve to come up with these dimensionless numbers. And I think you can get a feel here where if you look at one inch thick plywood, it's STC or it's is 24. If you look at eight inch thick hollow concrete block, it's STC's 45. If you go to a 12 inch thick concrete wall, it's 52. So the higher the number, the more blocking capabilities it has. You're gonna get a lot of noise control with this. This is when we're looking at 18 to 45 dBA. Uh, it's when treating the noise at the source becomes the main focus. We don't really care about the whole room. We want to look at the source. But looking at the source means you might have to enclose the source. Not a problem. All you want to do first is take into account, hey, I got a process or piece of equipment that needs to operate at a proper temperature. I can't let it overheat. So I need to make sure I can ventilate that heat. But when I ventilate that heat, I got to make sure that ventilation passage is controlled so noise doesn't break out there. We also have to look at if you're gonna enclose something or put a barrier around it or a barrier with a, with a, with a lid, an enclosure. What happens if this piece of equipment or uh, systems needs to be uh, maintained or if there's a catastrophic failure? All that needs to go into that design process. The reason I bring that up is a lot of people, the first thing they say is, we can't enclose that piece of equipment. And I think that's really, interesting uh, because you ask them why and it's because of each of these bullet points here at the bottom and that's why it's so important to take those into account and they can be taken into account so you can't go in blindly we need to make sure everything operates in fact a lot of systems when people want to or we say man the only thing we can do is enclose the process or do something the first thing we do is look at flow personnel flow process flow maintenance, access, and controlling the heat. Acoustics is kind of second nature. If we know we can do those first items, then acoustics we know we can do. So this can come in flexible barrier format. So you have an STC at 21 to 31. You can use this above drop ceilings or uh, break rooms and, and parts. You can adhere it to part chutes, uh, material handling duct. You can wrap that or process piping, anything that's making noise. And the nice thing is it comes in roll form. You can cut it easily with a utility knife and a straight edge or shear, industrial shears. A good example of this, what do we have these days? Boy, we have a lot of distribution centers all over the world. And uh, these distribution centers often have overhead conveyor systems. 
a lot of the noise coming from those conveyor systems isn't necessarily the product hitting the rollers. It's actually a lot of, although it is, it can be that too, especially when it compound, compounds and uh, noise level after noise level after per foot per foot and all these material going through based on the load of material transit, but also the motors uh, that are running the, these automated conveyor lines. So this particular one is a large warehouse where there's overhead conveyors and underneath this, I don't know if you can see my pointer or not, but underneath these conveyors is actually the mass loaded vinyl we had just talked about. The only difference is it has grommets installed into it. And everywhere there's a motor, it's hard to see here, but there's a motor right here uh, in the lower left picture, there's a motor and there's actually uh, some clips where you can undo that, drop the reinforced vinyl and service the motor very easily. But it controls all the noise propagating down to the personnel below. Now, the best thing, though, is the, the, the one thing with blocking noise, you got to be careful. Sometimes you can block noise over here. But all it's doing is reflecting the noise over into another area of the factory. The important thing is if you can introduce both sound absorption and sound blocking. So this is the best of both worlds, right? You're going to reduce some of the sound energy. You have sound energy. You have a massive wall here. You're going to reduce some of that energy reflecting into that uh, uh, sound absorber. Some of it's going to reflect back towards the source. Some of it's going to propagate through this heavy mass. So between the two, you're blocking noise from one side to the other, to the receiver, to the noise source. But you're also not just reflecting the sound energy somewhere. You're actually damping that sound energy. So it's a, it's a great combination. And there's products available to do that. But like we said, it's often... Uh, the composite, it's also uh, the combination sound absorption, sound blocking is often considered a composite, composite noise control. That's all it means is you got two uh, of the characteristics of noise control in there. It's when you need a significant amount of noise reduced. You're looking at, once again, the 18 to 45 dBA noise reduction targets, you know, on a typical application. And it's not redirecting noise to another area of the plant because you have the sound absorption in there. Same thing's important. The ventilation of the equipment or process, access for maintenance or catastrophic failure, and then visual ports, personnel access, all that. It's still all important. When you look at this, remember before we looked at a quilt and I only showed an NRC rating, a sound absorption uh, merit rating. But now this quilt actually has, if you look in the lower le lower right corner, it actually has a mass. Often those are one pound per square foot or two pound per square foot horizontal mass you see in there, that dark gray, sandwiched between two layers of quilt. So you get the sound absorption and the sound blocking. So this product has an NRC sound absorption merit rating, but also an STC sound blocking merit rating. You can see it used here in a few applications. The upper right is a crosscut saw. Everybody in the background of the upper right picture uh, was working with their back to this crosscut saw. No noise control. That this gray curtain system wasn't there. Nobody was in hearing protection. So everybody's back in the background was actually, their back was facing this. They didn't know when the person was going to chop or cut an aluminum extrusion piece. But boy, they knew it happened. If you were standing in this location, you could see everybody flinch uh, when it happened. So something as simple, though, as this composite mass-loaded vinyl uh, supported from a floor-mounted track system could also be ceiling suspended if you don't want any tracks in the way. And the only person that needed to continue to wear hearing protection or muffs was the operator. Everybody else, it was quiet and, and was in much better shape. Sometimes you'll have expansion, I call expansion tanks. They have orifice plates in them, uh, taking high pressure to low pressure and bleeding it off. Um, you can also take the same product and wrap or have custom fit jackets of the same material. You have the quilt both sides, the inner quilt that you don't see here that's facing the shell of this expansion tank is working as a decoupler. 
So that noise has to, can, can radiate, can ring, but it has to go through that first. Then there's a mass loaded vinyl blocking the noise and then an additional absorptive material. Uh, and one interesting thing here, the reason they don't just have the mass loaded vinyl on the outside, they have a quilt instead, is because quilt holds up to UV light better, much better than the, the facing than the mass loaded vinyl over time. I always like this picture because it's a perfect example of how we use the what's existing in the factory. So this was a cutting process. Um, they already had the yellow, I call it a safety, I hate to use the word cage, but I call it a safety cage. Uh, so there was all this yellow railing. Uh, there was a screen, uh, if you wanna call it in there. And, but there was noisy, pieces of equipment in there. So this is about six feet. I'm going to guess it's about six and a half feet tall. There's workers in the area, in the background, in the foreground here, and in the background. And so what they were able to do was take the mat, the composite mass loaded vinyl with the quilt with grommets and actually tie it and nylon zip tie it to the, uh, to the safety uh, uh, fence here. They also had areas of the of the machine right behind in the upper right or the right side you see these little boxes of quilt mass loaded vinyl composite they only needed to get in there periodically to service maybe once a day they were able to actually oh i'm sorry once a week these can actually be unbolted and pulled off they actually in some cases would use hooks so there's ways that you can retrofit the existing machine not affecting its operation one side note, anytime you have somebody looking at noise control or you're considering it yourself, always, um, always look at the process flow, always get the whole team involved. The person operating the area, the foreman or the, the supervisor of the area, make sure maintenance is involved in that team. Make sure your, your engineering and your safety team are involved. Always get everybody together. And when you look at this process, this was really neat. There was a question on here about heat. This particular process didn't have heat issues that we needed to be concerned with. Most of the heat was already open top, and so all the heat could rise. You can't see it here, but you're right. How does this affect the heat? Well, if there was heat problems here, we would want to take a look at ventilation, and we could replace some of those things with acoustic louvers uh, and, and some things with ventilation. For real hot processes, we can actually look at forced ventilation with silencing. This is a nice application here where you actually have, it, it just fits like a, you know, fit shoehorns it in. They had a, a little piece of equipment here that was making noise. Uh, we still wanted, we had a tight walkway. The, the customer still wanted it to look clean, true, uh, but can control the noise. So they were able to fit in a curtain system. And you also see the clear view, uh, flexible vinyl viewports. Those are also one pound per square foot. They also come in a two pound per square foot. They don't yellow anymore. Years ago, they used to yellow over time. These stay nice, crisp, and clean. So they were able to work in uh, to their system very cost effectively to control noise out of that piece of equipment. You can also look at something, you know, we were looking at STCs before of, of 20, 33, things like that. Now you need a lot more noise control. Maybe you got a centrifugal fan outdoors. Maybe you got a generator. Maybe you got some process that's creating quite a bit of noise. Maybe you're running at a at 110 dBA in a factory or, or things like that. You need to get much more massive. This is a, a product that, once again, composite noise control. You got an NRC of 0.95 to 1, and you got an STC of 37 to 48. Remember, the higher the number, the better the more blocking capabilities. The products like this come in four inch thick, which is most standard, and then also two inch thick when you have to really fit it into a tight space. Usually the material, this is, we call it a double wall system. We have material here, which is a usually a mineral wool or a fiberglass or a high temperature white wool insulation, perforated inner shell, solid outer shell, tongue and groove connections, both for ceilings and walls, make the same, use the same material to make doors, 
uh, and, and especially with these systems, usually those processes have a lot more heat associated with them too. So we're gonna be looking at ventilation, silencing, acoustic louvers, and sometimes doing heat load calculations to see if we need forced ventilation versus uh, uh, um, standard unforced ventilation. You can look at an example here. Here's a small stamping press uh, where you have a freestanding structure of all the four inch thick panels. Nice access here on either side, windows, sliding double doors to control that noise. This is a CNC machine. Boy, we see a lot of them. This particular CNC machine, sometimes CNC machines can be uh, solved using that composite curtain and making enclosure uh, with a roof out of that. But this particular one was quite loud, and we see others that are quite, quite loud where we actually use uh, the rigid panels. And what you see here is this is a ventilation silencer here. It's actually, when you, when you walk up through it, there's actually a curved air passage here, and there's insulating baffles in there, and we'll talk about those in a few minutes. But those are allowing air in. We were able to do a passive ventilation, and the reason I say passive Actually, the design of it was passive, but they actually have forced ventilation within the space as well to keep the heat down in the fumes. This is a piece of equipment inside a general working area, and we wanted to control, or they wanted to control that uh, noise. So uh, in the budget, this can come as a galvanized finish. It could come as an aluminum or stainless finish, but it can also come as a factory finish of color. In other words, powder coating. And uh, hey, powder coating didn't fit into the budget, but they had a serious noise issue. No problem, still just a galvanized finish looks really nice. Here's one that shows very interesting too, and the reason I threw this slide in is because you have the four inch thick panels here mounted to the top of the mezzanine. Uh, a lot of people working below down here, but also acoustic windows were incorporated. Those acoustic windows, they don't have sound absorbing characteristics, NRCs necessarily, but they do have an STC rating, sound transmission class, that merit rating on how, how well they can control the noise. And what we did was we were matching the STC of these windows, the sound blocking capabilities with the same STC as these four inch thick panels in the design. So we looked at everything that's basically an enclosure, a barrier wall, a absorption for the walls. But one key thing in, in facilities, there's a lot of ventilation fans, whether it's an exhaust ventilation off the roof, general building ventilation off the walls, whether it's a discharge off a dust collector or radiator, fresh air intake and discharge uh, downstream of a radiator cooled generator. You need ventilation silencing, or it could be that piece of air handling uh, that happens the, the that's supplying the the office the control room uh, the the front offices but it, it, that ductwork's passing through a noisy area of the facility you can wrap that duct but also you can put a silencer in tandem in the airstream so down the airstream upstream to downstream or downstream to upstream you're controlling the noise within the air passage uh, such as a duct systems. They come in many shapes and sizes. Uh, these are our most, most simplistic here is a straight rectangular on the left, a circular in the middle, and then an acoustic louver on the right. Uh, lots of, there's also these uh, rectangular straights on the left are also available in an elbow format. Uh, so if you need to put it in a bend or something like that. Now how do silencers work, okay? You gotta let air pass through these uh, we call it a top and bottom where you see the hatch marks. Uh, those are called baffles. The faces of the baffles are all perforated metal. The entrance noses of the baffles are solid metal. We stuff those baffles with insulating media. Usually plenum, well, not usually, but all, all times plenum rated. Now we're looking at a plenum rating, even more stringent than a class A rating. What happens is noise might come in from one end, as you see here on the left. Some of those sound waves actually due to this abrupt expansion of these baffles, pretend the outer line, top and bottom black lines are the outer shell of a piece of duct. We're inserting the silencer in for a piece of duct. Some of the noise actually bounces back towards the noise source just due to this abrupt expansion, necking down of the air passage cross section. 
then some of that sound energy, that's all noise is, is sound energy, it propagates through these perforated faces of the baffles and into that hatched insulating media. Then there's abrupt expansion where we open up again uh, abruptly uh, to um, uh, fill the air passage of the overall duct. Some of the noise actually bounces back from that. And then you have a reduced noise level downstream to the right here. Now we can control the pressure drops due to these tapered baffles that you see, these hatched baffles on the right of those. It's kind of a chamfered or taper. That's a slow expansion controlling your pressure drop and reducing your pressure drop. So it doesn't just dump into the space, it slowly expands. And so there's a lot of things. There's, there's other things you can use these for clean rooms. There's also different systems where they call it a packless silencer, where it's actually a bunch of impedance chambers in the baffle, and we do not use uh, insulating media. So just all kinds of opportunities. Three things rate, where we talked about before transmission loss, sound absorption, we talked about NRC and STC for quick comparison merits, merit comparisons. With silencing, you're looking at something called insertion loss. It's how many decibels per octave band, usually 63 hertz through 8,000 hertz center frequencies. How many decibels per octave band are we really subtr direct subtraction out of a noise source? There's also something called regenerated noise. If you push enough noise, enough air through a silencer, it's actually gonna generate noise. And you can kind of think of it like a whistle. If you have a whistle, uh, and the harder you blow through it, the louder it gets. So you want to control the pressure drop, control how much air is going through, because there is going to be a, eventually you can generate more noise and, and create more problems than you're gaining with insertion loss. And then there's a percent open area, and that's a function of how much open area between those restrictive baffles are there. And you can tune uh, the length of the silencer, the percent open area, and the shape of the silencer to get different noise control based on the sound noise spectrum of your noise source. Fans are the, as we said before, uh, dust collection, particularly conveying. Uh, fans are the major uh, issue when it comes to uh, uh, noise, usually in a, in a factory. And it's those blades just hitting on the air molecules and creating all this noise and you got different RPMs and things. And so when we look at this, we want to look at the airflow from the fan, uh, ACFM usually, uh, actual CFM. You can look at the SCFM and just correct for ACFM. But how much noise is going to go through the silencer or acoustic louver? And then, and then also we want to know how much available external static this fan's operating a system. So a lot of times above and beyond just being a general ventilation fan, but the fan itself can only build up so much static pressure to move that volume of air. So we want to make sure that we don't restrict it too much and affect the operation of the system. So we want to look at flow rates. We want to look at available static pressure just as a minor start uh, to get started on laying things out. This is a nice example here, general ventilation exhaust off a building. Uh, there can be multiples. Uh, this is just a circular silencer and vertical general exhaust uh, frame support system supporting because this fan down here should never uh, be expected to support the weight of such a silencer. So there's always external supports. That's not uncommon to see in its actual proper, proper practice. Uh, also, here is general exhaust off of a building as well, and you can see the round silencer just fits into the normal snaking of the ductwork. An interesting thing on here, and this particular job on the left picture, they actually saw, um, they actually saw a, uh, or they looked at just redirecting. In other words, this used to be the only elbow here on the left of the left picture just coming out of the building and all the noise was shooting with a rain hood was shooting out to the right of that picture then they said well let's put a silencer well the silencer and the space limitations didn't quite do it all but what they did was they turned this to shoot into another direction with the little bit of noise that was left in an area that was not of concern. The neighbors and things was not of concern. It was more of an open field. So uh, so that's some interesting things. Sometimes you can redirect the sound 
or you can use a silencer, or sometimes you use both. Another area is a lot of wastewater treatment facilities, and this is very interesting. It used to be where inside these pump rooms is where it was important. It was very important to keep it less than 85 dBA. But now in the areas, just walking around the facility, uh, maybe a wastewater treatment plant or a pump station, it, is, it has to be quiet. So a lot of the weather, uh, single blade weather louvers are being replaced with acoustic louvers. And with that, uh, Kay, that, that's what I have for today. I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, John. It looks like we have about seven or eight minutes left for questions. Just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send it to everyone. Uh, the first question that came through, John, um, had to do with, I believe, the quilted absorbers. Um, that slide, um, someone asked, is the quilted material flame resistant or chemical resistant? So the quilted, that's a great question. The quilted material is class A rated, so it meets the proper uh, fire ratings and fire test uh, E84 for for that. So is it fire retardant? No. Does it, it will it will it burn and smoke? Yes, but it meets a class A rating, which is usually what you'll need to get the permit within the facility. The second question I think was it for uh, cleaning is was that the second? I'm um, sorry. I, the second question uh, chemical was resistance. Uh, if it was chemical resistant. Yeah. Yeah, so for the chemical resistance for when it comes to the curtains, most often uh, it would be suggested to use a silicone faced uh, uh, quilted material. So it's a different facing we use uh, that you can use in its place. We also have a, there's also available a couple of other facings too, depending on how critical the, uh, the, the uh, corrosion resistance is or the chemical resistance needs to be and what the solution levels are of those. Uh, we can, we have a, there's a couple different products facings that can be incorporated into that quilt product, correct? Okay, great. Uh, the next question is also um, on that topic. Uh, I think it, the question is, um, do the different colors of quilted absorbers have different NRC? You know, that that's a good question too. We have a couple of different, uh, if you, for indoor applications, there's different facings, different colors. They all are, have about equal acoustic transparency. So we would not degrade uh, the performance or the NRC of those products. There is an outdoor absorber that uses a more stout, uh, which would be expected, right? Uses a more stout facing. That one does have a reduced sound absorption, but there's different data that's published for that that we would that that would be used in industry. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, the next question I have is: Do you have options in pharmaceutical or GMP areas? For example, needs to be easy to clean and cannot break easily. We are at this point uh, working. That is. Um, I hate to say in my 30 year career, geez, I never thought I'd say 30 years, but uh, that has been the number one question, uh, a clean room type product for noise control. There's a clean room type sound absorption for noise control that's easy to clean and can be used, but often you need more noise control than that 10 to 12 dBA. And so it has been, when you look at different products, that have a higher mass and you want to enclose something or put a barrier and support it. It's the track system that supports it that tends to be the issue to keep clean. And there's actually some solutions being worked on right now. Uh, I can tell you, if you can come up with something, you, be, you become quite rich pretty quick because it's a huge demand in industry, but that is something that's being worked on. Okay, thank you. The next question I believe came in while you're talking about the sound absorption panel. Um, someone's wondering, could this compromise fire alarms and announcements? Um, not to that extent. Actually, what it'll do, that's a great question, by the way, because I, I thought that myself you, uh, when I first got into the business. But what's neat is that it actually tones down the noise level so the speech intelligibility Intelligent, intelligent, well, sorry, 
anyway, you get what I'm saying. It's actually to under, better to understand each other because it's getting rid of all that erroneous background noise and honing in on the 500 to 1,000 hertz. And you can actually understand better. It doesn't reduce that noise because that's usually so loud compared to uh, what we're trying to do. So yeah, you're in good shape with that. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question I have is, what was the real world reduction in noise in decibels derived from the MLV panels, which do not completely cover all surfaces? So that MLV panel, we looked at one that, uh, that uh, was underneath the uh, uh, overhead conveyor systems. I'm not sure if that's the one, but on that overhead conveyor system, it actually dropped that in the area because it was such an isolated area, all the hot spots along that whole track. Uh, it actually reduced that 14 dBA in that, that facility. I'm not sure if that's the one they talked about, but that's. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next question I have is, will the cleaning products affect the shelf life of the absorbers and would frequent cleaning reduce the fire rating? Uh, no, you'd have, well, first of all, you want to look at the cleaning agent, right? There's some things that you can clean and there's some things that are a little harder to clean. Uh, the. Any of the hanging baffles are, are easy to wipe down or steam clean. Uh, definitely don't power wash. <laughs> We've had people do that and shred them up. The quilt is easy to, to vacuum clean and it will withstand absorption. So if you were to spray it down with a 309 or I mean a 409 or some type of all purpose cleaner, you would be fine. The Perforated metal panels are best surface vacuumed and, and wiped down. So the answer is, can it be cleaned? Yes, we, there, every product, and that's one thing you should always look at, and these are great questions, is when you're looking at a product out there in industry, always make sure that you find out that you can clean it, and, and all the products uh, should have directions on how to do that. So you would be able to get that. The other thing is, is on the... Uh, Luckily, none of these really absorb your cleaning solution. So as long as your cleaning solution is not, you know, uh, highly flammable, <laughs> then you're going to be in good shape. Okay, great. Thank you, John. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time here today. I see um, we didn't get to a few questions, but I just wanted to let everyone know that we'll be sharing all the questions from the chat from today's event with kinetic noise control. So if we didn't get to your question, please know that we will pass it along. Um, I wanted to thank you, John Sofra, for your presentation, Kinetics Noise Control, for sponsoring today's webinar and all of our participants. We appreciate you joining us for the last Synergist webinar of 2022. We hope everyone has a safe and healthy holiday season and look forward to new Synergist webinars next year. Thanks to everyone again and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. The recording will be available at aiha.webvent.tv. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with that link. And please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.